of Michel that was a couple of years ago when I was here before in New York between 2006-2010 and that was I think 2010 that I came here or 2009 uh, and it was a similar occasion and really I am so delighted to have this chance again to revisit and to be in this wonderful place with this wonderful gathering and view these prominent professors Dr. Skander Professor Skander, Professor Gollett, and uh, it's really a great honor. Of course, uh, I, I now recall my first visit to Abydos, and it's really breathtaking. Uh, maybe it's not, people usually go to uh, the traditional places in Luxor and so on, but maybe not many people go to Abydos, but those who went there will really so much uh, have more grasp and capture what we listen and hear from uh, our distinguished professors. Uh, I think it's important to think about uh, Egyptian civilization. There are two approaches to things, to this issue and other things. There is the approach of the car postal, that you can go have a picture in front of the pyramids or in front of the temple, and then you are satisfied that you have engaged with the Egyptian civilization. <laughs> but I think you have to go more in depth because the civilization is not only edifices and temples and monuments, but behind this there are lots of culture, religion, mythology, uh, engineering, uh, architecture. There are lots of what's beyond the uh, simple uh, uh, things which we see on the surface. So I think this is a chance to dive in and to get into these deep uh, uh, horizons of the Egyptian uh, civilization. Of course, this civilization is at the end a heritage of humanity. And it is uh, Egyptian civilization, it is African civilization, it is human civilization. I just want to, to conclude by referring to this uh, wonderful or very uh, really uh, simulating bits of how the Egyptians viewed life and death. You would almost find them simultaneous in the same. In Abydos, of course, uh, it was the, one of the very earliest uh, pre-dynasty uh, sites. And uh, during the first dynasty, most of the rulers, or almost all of the rulers, I think, were buried in that uh, area. At the same time, it turned out in the uh, with the dynasty to be one of the very prestigious pilgrimage sites. And uh, people used to go to the pilgrimage there, and it was very looked at in a very noble and very prestigious manner. It's a place which had a very sacred status. And these actual Egyptians, when they were living, they were thinking about death. And in death, they were thinking about life. And this really cycle, I think, something very interesting in the Egyptian uh, 
uh, philosophy of all the Egyptians that they can spend big part of their life preparing for their death. And when they go for death, they are taken with them all the delights and all the joyful things when they want to have with them when they come again to life. I think this cycle is something very uh, interesting and very uh, uh, peculiar to the uh, Egyptian uh, or the Egyptian philosophy about this continuity of life and death in a continuous cycle. I think I have to stop here because we have to listen to the very interesting uh, lecture and uh, presentation by our prominent research professor. Thank you very much. Thank you. This evening, we learned from two extraordinary speakers who have voluminous publications and international reputations. For over 10 years, they have been co-directors of New York University Epigraphic Expedition to the Temple of Ramesses II in Abydos, which has involved the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities. With an undergraduate degree from Harvard and doctorate from Columbia, Clinical Research Professor Abdin Gillette, Jr. additionally forwards an enormous list, including many of this room, invitations to diverse lectures, and the situation regarding looted antiquities, the significance of which cannot be minimized. The NYU dissertation topic of visiting scholar Samak Iskander, former president of the American Research Centers in Egypt, as well as a member of the Presidential Advisory Council, concerned the reign of Pharaoh Menepta, one of Ramesses II's hundred sons, whose famed Theban stele was discovered by Flinders Petrie, affording Sama an enviable pedagogical lineage. In their 2014 program, likewise jointly supported by the Archaeology Committee and RC New York, Doctors Gillette and Iskander discussed Abydos. Today they will expand upon their initial lecture about Osiris's historic cult site during the Ramesses period and provide an update of this seminal site. Thank you, Michelle, for this nice introduction for both of us. Uh, our talk today, Gillette and myself, will split the time think equally, I hope equally, uh, about the Ramesside monuments in Abydos. For those who are not familiar with Abydos, it's a site 500 kilometers south of uh, uh, modern Cairo, or Memphis, and 60 kilometers south of Sohag. It is the uh, religious center of one of the most popular gods of ancient Egypt, Osiris, the god of the hereafter, the god of the dead, the god of uh, the old Egyptians, and their hope for the next life. This is an aerial uh, photograph of the site. And it's, it, it's, it's located between the cliffs, western cliffs, and the uh, cultivat cultivation. And here is a mile, it's about eight kilometers north-south and two kilometers east-west. It's, uh, it's, it's filled with uh, impressive monuments that date back to the early pre-dynastic, 33, 3500 BC, all the way down to the late Roman or Coptic period, which is the 8th century AD. We're talking about 4,000 years of activity. The site has become a, a very popular pilgrimage site. And tonight we will focus on one of these monuments, which is the Temple of Ramses II. Here is the temple, uh, just outside the town, the modern town, uh, village of Araba Matfuna. Just to give you an idea of the size of the temple, it's 70 meters long by 35, 37 meters wide. That's about a little bit over 200 feet by over 100 feet, and it's about 30 meters just west of the 
town of Araba, and also that part is was part of the temple, but has mostly disappeared now. The temple was built by Ramses II, who ruled for uh, 67 years, from 1279 to 1212. It's known as uh, Ramses the Great. He was a man of uh, ceaseless activity and immense energy. He fought one of the biggest uh, battles in the ancient history, Battle of Kadesh, and also entered into the, uh, one of the most famous peace treaty that Egypt entered to, at the first one. So he's a man of war and peace. There's hardly any site uh, without the traces of his monuments. Just to give you an idea of the temple, uh, this is the west, the eastern facade of the temple, as it looks now, and this is how it looks from inside. And this is a schematic of how the structure, how the temple looked like. And parts of the temple are very well preserved, and you can see here this, the, 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 the color and the uh, painted reliefs, but other parts need extensive restoration. The temple is known also for a, the uh, inscriptions of the famous Battle of Kadesh that I just mentioned, and uh, that ended up with the peace treaty. And the peace treaty is in the Karnak Temple, and a copy of it is at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, and I thought it's fitting to show it here that we have the ambassador here. <laughs> And we know that the temple lasted for about a thousand years because in the Cairo Museum there's a sarcophagus of Hunu, which is a cow priest of the temple of Ramses II in Abydos, dated to Ptolemy IV and II, about 200 BC, that gives us about a thousand years of activity. This is a schematic of the temple. And uh, in front of the temple now, there are some mud brick walls where the uh, early Christians moved in, in here and built a, some kind of a small settlement. And we're looking here north. This is a schematic of the temple as it stands now. And this season, we discovered a palace just outside, south of the temple, only three meters south of the temple. So I'm going to go through this. But before I do that, I just want to go back and uh, talk about our mission and what we have done in Egypt, Agden and myself, since 2007 when we started the project. The goals of our mission is to produce complete epigraphic documentation of the temple, which we did two years ago, three years ago. A published translation of all the temple inscriptions and graffiti with comprehensive analysis which was just about to get it out. <laughs> uh, also, uh, we started already the process of temple conservation, restoration, and site management. And uh, last is to provide training for local Egyptologists. I'm going to go through these. Well, this is the second volume that we're just about to come out. So this is the plan of the temple, and the first, now that we finished the documentation and the translation and working, start to work on the conservation and the restoration. So we have two objects now, two uh, ways to start. First, we need to identify the uh, enclosure wall of the temple, because it's within it there are so many uh, uh, things there that actually serve as the temple. So it's in, important to understand what's inside the enclosure temple. And once we find the enclosure temple, we want to, or we did already, we're doing an excavation all around here, and we find a lot of fragments that fell from the temple, and we are collecting them, and we are ending up with a lot of fragments. A lot. Hundreds. Some of them are large, some of them are small. 
So we have been putting together like a puzzle work. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, if anyone to volunteer, we're happy to have. <laughs> so we started uh, in the west side, in the west part of the temple. We identified the uh, enclosure wall to the west, and here is the enclosure wall. Uh, it's, and this is the foundation, it's a little bit over three meters, which means that the height should be between two and a half to three times the width, so we talk about seven to uh, nine meters high. Then, once we, just, we did this, we went, we want to find the, the closure wall this way, we lift this to the end because this is the high, uh, the high drain here, so we leave this to the end. So we started to excavate to the east, which is this part here. And uh, it's uh, the, the, the wall of the pylon. It's eight meters wide with a mud brick stamped with a Ramses II. Eight meters wide wall. That makes the height two and a half to three times. It's about 20 meters to 24 meters. So, obviously, most likely, this is the pylon, brick pylon, uh, eight meters high, and probably after that the drops, and we join the three meters in the back, we can trace some of the walls, some of the parts of the walls here. So, but this is it's a very preliminary layout, and also the inscriptions on the southern wall indicates or shows two pylons. Bechneti Yuerti, two, two pylons in an amount made of uh, limestone. But interestingly, this season, while we're working in this area, we have noticed that there might be another structure below this part here, in here. And this is what we see. This is the mud brick of the pylon. And then as we went down, we know this is Ranch II because it's a uh, stand. But in here, there's another wall, different size, that goes down. And there's sand. So this, there was a cut that made in the wall to, to accommodate and build the one of Ramses II. So this is a preliminary indication that there is a structure that existed before the pylon or the wall and was cut. Yeah, and then when we have Ramses, and this is the other uh, bricks to the on the side, and there's some on the other side too. Now I'm going to talk about the colossal statue, and I'll tell you why I have the second S between parentheses. Here is a, a, a head of Ramses II that was discovered by the ministry in the late 90s. It's a 67 feet high. And uh, this is the nemesis. We have the nemesis in the temple now. The head is in uh, somewhere in Ahmim. So we put them together and, and on paper and they fit. And we have other parts of the uh, statue that we found. The legs are 186, 186 centimeters high, just like this. So we put the statue together on paper, and this is how it looks like. For those who are familiar with the statue of Ramses at the entrance of the Metropolitan Museum, this is time and a half the size of that statue. And that's what it would look like. We found several other pieces that will will open uh, in the torso and in the leg. So, because it was found on the southern side of the of the gate, so it belongs to this. When we put it back, we put it back there. So, because of the symmetry of Egyptian architecture, there must be another one on the right hand side. So we started excavating, and sure enough, we found a base exactly similar to the base on the south side. So where is the statue? We did not find the statue. 
instead of the set you found uh, broken, gray uh, granite that would fill 24 bags. We have no idea what happened to that statue. Uh, we still can see it in, in the cut, just around the statue. But we couldn't go any further, because beyond that, there is the Coptic mud brick walls, and we don't want to move one layer for the sake of another layer, one layer of history for another layer of history. So, we leave it at that for the time being. We also devoted a whole season for a field school uh, that for the 12 inspectors of the Ministry of Antiquities, and uh, we embedded them in our work, so they had hands-on uh, experience. We had daily lectures and hands-on uh, excavation, surveying, photography, uh, ceramic uh, identification, and uh, illustration and graphics. And then we have a final exam, uh, and then we have the graduation of the 12, uh, the 12 inspectors, and uh, they have a sign here, they said they have to put a sign here, because we need to learn more. And I hope every uh, mission should think about uh, dedicating at least one season for a field school. And here is the whole field school with the instructors and the staff. Uh, in 2019, this season also, we uh, wanted to excavate at the four corners of the temple, to, looking for uh, foundation deposits that usually are put at the time the, uh, the, the construction uh, starts. We did not find any foundation deposits. But instead, we found unusual in, uh, uh, cartouches on the four corners, each corner two, so we have eight, uh, painted in a uh, very vivid golden yellow color, extremely, extremely unusual. I think there's one uh, at the Temple of City, but there's hardly any uh, publication. Uh, or there, there is a photo, but it's not very clear. And uh, one other corner, uh, the color has disappeared, but you can see the carving is very, very fine. But this has indicated something else. Usually, temples are built from the rear, which is the west, all the way to the east. And the fact that these cartouches here are inscribed by the name of Francis II, this means it's Francis II who actually started building the temple. And that puts to rest uh, the debate among many Egyptologists and scholars as who started the temple of the temple here. Some opinions that it was City who started it and then Ramses continued. Uh, we go to the temple palace. While we're working we notice there are three we know that there are three doors to the temple one to the north and two to the south. But these two doors on the side were blocked in antiquity. This was not. So we were very curious why this door was not blocked like the other two doors. So here is the north door blocked in antiquity, probably during the Ramses or during the Ramesside, but we know it's almost, it's the same, the same stone in the southeast, but this one was not. The, the, this uh, mud break was uh, built about 100 years ago. So there must be something special about this door. So we decided to, to excavate just around the door to see if we find another, any indication of the purpose of this door, of there any foundation deposits here. So here where we started. And we didn't really find anything, but we decided to go a little bit further down. We did, so we found this uh, the, the, the blocks of limestone, but they were exactly aligned with the center line of the door. 
So we decided, which is another view, this is the temple here and this is the, the blocks that we found, we decided to excavate them this way. And as we went this way, walls started to appear. Just, this is about three and a half meters, and then we have here a wall started to appear. So from there, we went full blast. And we, uh, we went south, and this is going from, from north, looking at the, uh, looking, looking north, and here is the door. And uh, the excavation, and then you can see here some of the earlier excavations, quote unquote, by somebody who was trying to find something. <laughs> I don't know when, and I don't know what they found, but we found other things. So, and this is uh, the ceiling of that structure, fell and into huge pieces, and here we're trying to get these pieces out. And this, the whole ceiling is inscribed, as painted with uh, uh, stars. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, yellow stars. There's a door leading somewhere. And uh, we, we cleared the floor. It's all in the floor was in, in a very good condition. And here we go. That is the palace. Um, and you can see the center line of the palace is aligned with the center line of the door that goes all the way and aligned with the another door that's blocked in antiquities. So we think this is a uh, uh, ceremonial palace that uh, the king would use during his visit for preparation, for purification, for uh, putting on the regalia that, that would he would use but as he walk in here and turn left, and this is the first side of the hall. So the most start to get the there is no access here except for the high priest of uh, which is Egypt and some of the priests for uh, service. And this is the uh, the plan, and here is what you see here. These are the limestone walls, but very unusual structure, just. Outside the walls is mud brick walls, sort of encasing the the walls of the of the, of the palace. So we stopped here. This is only part of the structure of, of the temple palace. And here, what I was saying, the limestone wall of the palace, and then encased in mud brick on the outside. Let us see mud brick, uh, limestone mud brick. So this is now the plan, the new plan of the temple, and the palace associated up to here we need to, this is what we know so far. This pattern of a temple palace associated, linked to the temples, is common, very common in the Ramesside period. So we have here the temple of uh, city in Abydos, we have here the, the Temple Palace to the southeast. The one in the city in Borna, same thing, southeast. Mernata, southeast. Ramasang, southeast. And Medina Tabo, southeast. Some of them are outside the temple, like this one, this one. Some of them are inside the temple, but there's a pattern of southeast. But the whole pattern, the pattern isn't even go back all the way back to the uh, early times when we have in the Shuna, we have a palace also the southeast in, uh, in the Zosa complex. It is a small little, uh, the, the, the yellow should move a little bit to the left. There's a palace here, same thing here with the middle kingdom, uh, which just has disappeared, and this is the new kingdom which I just went through. There's also a scene in the Theban tomb of Neb Quen and Nefer, 2TT 157, that shows Ramses II and Nefertari handing an appointment to a Neb Quen and Nefer promotion to be the high priest of Amun at the end of his second year. This is year one, third month. 
at the second year of the Temple of Ramses II, the palace in the city temple was not finished, so the only palace would have been the one of Ramses. So I'm arguing that this is the palace of Ramses that we just described. We just uh, go to the archaeological finds. There is this head uh, that has striated wavy hair that is typical of the third dynasty statuary. We have one in the Prussian Museum, Prussian Museum, Louvre, and British Museum that dates to the third dynasty. There is almost nothing in the entire area of Abydos that dates to the third dynasty, except some uh, small items of um, uh, King Zoser, but no statuary uh, at all. And this was a mystery as, you know, the, for the lack of the third dynasty, uh, as Matt has mentioned in one of the recent email. Right, Matt? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and we have here also um, what appears to be a uh, Amarna small statue, but we are working on that. And then we have this beautiful handwriting, Ramsat handwriting. And with some manipulation, we get more uh, inside of the uh, uh, lettering. And uh, we get it translated by uh, Anna Nefretorova. And we have the uh, verse points here that's important for copying and, and uh, students' writing. And it turned out to be the 15th chapter of uh, the instructions that was uh, formed in the, uh, the beginning of the 12th century. It's a very famous text that was, that was copied over and over and over for 1,500 years throughout Egypt, uh, mostly in Thebes, Memphis, and uh, probably the Ramses. But this is the first time we find one in Abydos. It's a very emotional text about wisdom uh, instructions of the king to his son. We have also uh, Ostraka, uh, Coptic Ostraka, and this is obviously a student uh, who's writing several ways how to start a letter. We have a lot of other Ostrakas, a lot of other letters that needs to be, we need to go through them and translate. We also have a uh, stela of um, the goddess Taweret, the goddess of fertility and childbirth. And she's usually depicted with uh, the animal head, hippopotamus head, but this is here very unusual to have find this with a human head. Actually, the person who found this, uh, his name is Isam, who found it, and uh, we couldn't understand why we're making such a big deal of finding this beast. To explain to him, this is the goddess of childbirth. And so he, sh he shook his head, he said, my wife is giving birth today. So he went home, he came back the following day, he said, she gave birth, and I would like to thank her. So, uh, and we found also uh, Stilaf, several stelae, and uh, lots of pottery. Most of the pottery found is uh, late Roman, Coptic period, but uh, we have New Kingdom, and we have some, some Middle Kingdom, some late uh, Old Kingdom, and few pre-dynastic in the site. And some uh, uh, which is very unusual, but we have a Semitic scene and the two set uh, images. So this is what we have now. Uh, this is the site, and what we need to do next year is to go and excavate south, 
east and west. Because we have the door going this way, and the door going this way, and the door going this way. We want to find out where these doors are leading to. So the timeline of our finds is we go from the third dynasty, 27th century BC, all the way to the Coptic period. That's the period of over 3,000 years in just this little part of the palace. Before I go, I have to thank our team, Muhammad Aghib, Muhammad Ibrahim, Muhammad Khatib, Hassan Shehab, Iman Zahid, Silver Skander, remember that, uh, Amr Muhammad, uh, uh, Mila Koronos, and Bashir Mufid. And of course, all our team. And I'd like to uh, thank the Ministry, the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, for giving us the privilege to work in Egypt for uh, 12 years since, since 2007, and the National Arts Club, and Michelle, and RC, with all their coordination, our work with the, with the, with the ministry, and for their work for the past 70 years restoring uh, Farhanic. Coptic Muslim monuments and for RC in New York. Stephanie, thank you very much. I'm going to be talking uh, more about the religious side of the temple. I'm not an archaeologist, I've never put so much of a teaspoon in the soil of Egypt. So this is uh, what I do. Um, as far as this temple goes, actually uh, all of the real action, so to speak, of uh, Bios, the great uh, processions, take place uh, off screen. But they're very much uh, uh, tied into the temple uh, nonetheless. But this was largely a processional, uh, a place for processional barks. Uh, the one scholar uh, that, that, um, uh, likened it to being a large uh, uh, bark chapel. I'm uh, exceptionally well uh, appointed. I'd like to, st uh, to stretch that a little further and say it was sort of like a uh, bus station for barks. Uh, they uh, came and went, and uh, but a couple of them uh, stayed permanently. Actually, as a bark chapel, uh, the, the only uh, a few, uh, half of the, the, the rooms of this uh, the temple are made for uh, barks. This is what the temple looks like, or looked like, I should say. Um, and it has a normal sort of three, tripartite division uh, common in uh, Ramazide temples. You have a uh, sun court. Uh, 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 surrounded by a hyperstyle hall, and uh, you go up some steps, and as you go into the temple, the level rises, the uh, ceiling goes down, and uh, the, uh, the, the chief place, uh, the, 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 uh, the main cult place, was in, in the back. Now, um, as you go in, to a temple uh, like this, the um, there's a problem of uh, I wouldn't say a problem. There's a, uh, levels of access that people could uh, uh, go into. Egyptian temples were not made for anybody to walk in, and uh, they were open really only at uh, festival days. Uh, this is the first level of access. Uh, I would not um, uh, th th put the lines on uh, that side uh, of that, this uh, portico anymore. And I'll show you the reason. Um, this um, area was accessible to people, uh, the common people. Up here, uh, you're getting into the area where only priests uh, can uh, go. Uh, once uh, this came to light, 
uh, I uh, changed my mind entirely that, uh, that uh, common people could not uh, uh, go beyond uh, that point, not up the stairs into the temple. So this gave access to the high priest, the king, the upper level, so they could go right onto the restricted area of the temple. And as you go back, uh, the, 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 probably the access, which priests could go where, uh, changed. Uh, I can't say which level uh, a priest on, a, let's say, a staff uh, the, the, the list could go to which part. But certainly only the highest uh, level of priest could go back to this uh, to these uh, chapels here, which are the chief chapels of uh, Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the Theban, uh, I mean the uh, Syrid uh, triad. Now, the temple is very nicely organized, and the procession route goes right down the middle to the back, to Chapel D, where the uh, the chief cult place of Osiris was within the temple. And you can see, uh, as you look at it, the temples that were this, um, oriented east-west were the main, uh, uh, not the temples, but the rooms, were the main uh, rooms of the temple. All the other things like uh, these here uh, immediately sort themselves out as the uh, the uh, subsidiary uh, chapels. Now, uh, th th this is a very frustrating temple to work with because it was plundered for, all, for millennia uh, for stone. And so what you're looking at when you go through the temple is just something like only about a third to a quarter of the uh, temple. It's very frustrating. So if you're reading something like a speech, uh, we, we know such things only by reconstruction, but we only have the, the uh, bottom lines of the speech. Uh, so often we don't know what a speech is for. We don't know what a, uh, what a, a text is for. We have to sort of figure that out by deduction if we can at all. Very frustrating to work with. But um, one thing that suddenly gave us uh, a lot of um, insight on how this temple worked was this staircase, which is not a bark chapel at all. Um, and when we uh, went uh, up this, you can see it's a very steep staircase. Um, it, 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 you needed uh, some sort of um, step to get up to there, and uh, it uh, went right up to the roof. So you're standing on the roof, and suddenly you come to the amazing, uh, up here, come to the amazing conclusion that the temple had a roof. Uh, it's, it's an obvious but very profound uh, thing. You suddenly realize that this, that it added another dimension, literally, to our perception of the temple. And uh, this um, inscription, broken inscription, like so many things, on the, uh, the wall of going up the staircase gave us a real insight to what uh, uh, sort of levels of worship and what was going on in this uh, temple more than almost anything else. Now here's the inscription. It says, a place for uh, or of supplications. The hearing of the petitions of gods and men, whom they, the sun god, shines upon, May he put down his renovating rays. In other words, the sun would hit a statue or a person and renovate him so that they, the people, uh, the rays, might shine upon his processional image, session, uh, which is this sign here, 
namely that of Ramsey's beloved of a moon like they. This first part of this, of this text deals with popular religion. The rest is sort of the temple religion, the elite religion. <coughs> On the other side is this enigmatic fragment of a uh, inscription on the uh, east side of the wall and it shows uh, the temple name written as we would say cryptically uh, with uh, sort of playing around with the signs and this uh, fellow standing up there a god holding a sail and so uh, here's another thing bringing a statue or person an image up to the top of this uh, the roof exposed the uh, the um, uh, person to the, the life-giving breezes, and sometimes in the Book of the Dead you see people holding up little sails like that in, uh, to show that the air is uh, there. And this is a pun on the uh, the name of the of the temple. Uh, the, the, the name of the Abbey known, the Tower, the great, um, the great land, but it also can mean the great breeze. So an, another uh, dimension of the temple comes up. Now, when uh, a, a couple of years ago, uh, while um, looking, uh, digging at one of the two doors that, that Sam was talking about, excuse me, uh, the, one of the doors of the, uh, of the temple, the southeast door, we found an ostracon there, and Sam told me about that. And then I looked at the place where the, um, uh, it came out of, and I looked up there and I said, my goodness, those are pilgrim marks. This is a way of praying uh, to a god, especially if the door is shut. You run your finger over the surface and you get grit, and you say a prayer, you get the, uh, the protective quality of the, of the holy uh, wall uh, on you, and you can also send the prayer, so to speak, into the temple. And this seems to be the door that people could enter in when it was unblocked into this, uh, the uh, accessible part of the temple. And all these little red dots here are other grooves. In other words, this was an area in which people went in, could go in, leave little marks, prayers, ho hope to enlist the power of the god, uh, in um, uh, their daily life. So uh, th this is a, a, a bit of the, the whole Vanazide religious program to open up temples to make them much more uh, uh, um, open to the general public, not, these with, uh, not all for the elite, the practice of the elite religion. And on um, many, many, uh, practically every single column in this temple is a special sort of logographic um, rebus that says, Dua Rahit Neb. All the people praise, and then the king's cartouche there, or God's name. And so uh, th th this was a very special little uh, device which told people, you can stand here and pray. Of course, uh, here's a, an example of this. I have to give, make a, a cautionary note here. This, is a, this little scene up, up there is from the most inaccessible pl uh, place in the temple, uh, the uh, sort of uh, the, the, the hardest place to reach, and certainly out of reach of the uh, of a common person. But for the most part, this told the illiterate people where they could stand and where they could pray during uh, the uh, processions. And another way you could get your message to the God 
when, uh, and incidentally, how the wonderful directional nature of this to uh, temple, you're looking all the way back to the main uh, uh, chapel of Osiris there. But you could play through uh, uh, images on the wall or the statues, and in fact we have a couple of these uh, uh, these uh, prayer uh, or pilgrims gouges all over the outside of the wall. So a new dimension uh, that comes out of the temple. Now this is uh, the sort of raison d'etre of the temple, the, the bark, the processional bark, which uh, carried the statue of the god out on procession. So here's the uh, the, uh, the statue normally hidden in the temple coming out in the view where people could see, well not quite see it, it was, it was hidden inside of this shrine. The, the words for this are seshamu and um, that's uh, the main word. Sometimes you, it can be a seshamu hu uh, referring to this fan that protects uh, the, the, uh, the statue or the god from the light of the sun. And this very intriguing word, wechet nefru, that which lifts up the, uh, the beauty of the god. Now, what really mattered in all of these terms was the session, or the focus of the, uh, the statue, even if you couldn't see it inside of the bark. And uh, the, the, the various writings are not all that uh, accurate. Uh, that is, uh, you can't really say that this writing meant that the, there was, uh, the statue was in a, a bark. Now here, two of the barks, um, again, you can see the the trouble we have, you know, we have <laughs> uh, most of the wall is missing. But we can tell that this is the, uh, the bark of the deified uh, king, Ahmose, the founder of the 18th dynasty, the founder of the new kingdom. Uh, his, this statue may have been stationed actually many uh, miles away. Uh, near his uh, pyramid, uh, ruins of his uh, pyramid. And we have the, the bark of Seti I, which was brought over from his temple and put up on a, a bark stand. And here you can see the fan uh, designating this as a session who. This is one of these uh, uh, devices, these uh, vehicles uh, of religion uh, look like. They had an aegis, uh, usually with some recognizable form of the god on it. Uh, so uh, again, a, an illiterate person could tell which god was hidden in uh, the shrine uh, on the bark. And the, it had carrying poles uh, like that that rested on uh, the shoulder of the, uh, of the priest. But inside, was, inside of this apparatus was the statue of the god hidden from sight. And this is what the, a procession looked like. Uh, I, I, the priest probably did not wear these masks but um, they would be out in public, coming out of the temple, people would see this, and uh, th th not being flipped by some, this is a divinely appointed parade float. It shows, uh, it would raise the god above the heads of the people all packed together along the processional route. Uh, just as you see kids, sitting up on their uh, daddy's shoulders so they can watch uh, the, the parade go by. And it, 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 just as a parade float puts uh, something up above where people can see it, so did this. And this was the presentation of the god to the public at large. Now, um, except for the uh, little reality check here, 
except for the uh, chapel D here, the, where the, uh, the, the statue of the god of Silas was, this, these doorways are very narrow. They're the size of a New York City apartment door. So obviously, uh, you can't have people walking in for breast in there. In fact, can you even get two people walking? Uh, uh, so these things are idealizations of things that were actually going on. Uh, but there were many stone benches here marked in red where you could put uh, cult uh, statues as well. Now, another thing that these uh, barks did is they provided a way of communicating with the god. And this is the Egypt, famous Egyptian oracle. Uh, the bark would come out and people would submit a question in the writing, everything's in writing, uh, submitted in the writing, and uh, by interpreting the way the bark moved, uh, you'd get the message from the god. And here is the high, uh, one of the high priests of the temple. He had a dispute with somebody over the ownership of land, so he had the temple bark uh, come out, and uh, uh, we, we hear that the, when he put down his claim, the bark nodded. You can see that the bark would go like that. And when the, uh, his uh, rival put down his claim, the bark walked away, sort of like refusing it. And of course, he's the high priest, and he pays all these guys here. As we say in New York, the fix is in. <laughs> but um, uh, most of these things actually were honest. Uh, at Del Medina, there was an oracle that uh, went on for years, uh, centuries, and it was uh, trusted by the local inhabitants. Um, so it's not always a, a crooked thing. But it brings, it allows the gods to speak to the people. Another fascinating thing about these barks is this element here. It's an imitation of a sledge. Um, and it's, you definitely could not pull that apart. It's, it's embedded in, in uh, the carrying poles. And this is the old way in which things were brought out into the desert. Because that was what went on at Abydos. You had a long procession out of the desert. And uh, the old way of doing it before you raise the uh, beauty up so people could see was to drag statues on sledges. Uh, this is a scene you probably know if you've been in the Metropolitan Museum that shows a statue being dragged this way. And there's the hieroglyph for a sledge showing it aspectively. And uh, here's this remarkable statue of a statue uh, of Amenhotep III. And you can see he, it's on a sledge. Here's uh, the moving a, I think it was a, uh, eight meter, eight cubit high statue, stone statue on a sledge. And so that's embedded right into the, uh, uh, the carrying poles. It's homage to the old uh, tradition of, of uh, processions. Now, uh, here's another way you can carry uh, a, a, a heavy shrine like that on carrying pole. And notice, even here, where it's totally inappropriate, uh, the, uh, the indication of a sledge. And uh, the word for shrine, throughout this temple, the Kali shrine, has this sledge base on it. And even when they talk about a chamber, the pearware chamber, a stone chamber in uh, a, a room, in absolutely immovable in the temple, still has that in there. Go, harking back to the tradition. Now, here is uh, shrine, shrines 
going down the steps in the, Tal uh, in the, the relief in the Ptolemaic Temple, and um, <laughs> I bought this thing from a, uh, a German scholar of mine. Incidentally, a, a little known secret about ancient Egypt is that the ancient Egyptians really spoke German. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, now it occurred to me, obviously, if uh, you can bring things down steps, you could also bring things up steps. And in the narrow confines of the, the, uh, the, the staircase that we have, uh, this is the only way, the way an image of Sesamu could have gone up, not on a bark. It would have to be teeny, pointless. So, <clears throat> and here's a little wordplay where they're lifting up the beauty hidden inside of the shrine. Now, the main uh, uh, bark, in fact, in this temple was not a bark. It was the so-called Osiris fetish. And here we see a, a depiction of it at rest in the, uh, uh, the Seti temple. It's also called the Osiris uh, symbol or the Osiris emblem. Uh, it's worshiping an object. And people get very uh, uneasy about using the word fetish because it's sort of uh, 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 it goes, ties to a, a, a primitive form of religion, no? But I would like to point out that if the word fetish was good enough for the sophisticated, the predilections of the sophisticated Viennese of Freud's uh, clientele, it's good enough for the Egyptians as well. And this is what this thing looked like. It had a hat box like thing, and the head of Osiris was supposedly in that. <coughs> Osiris was a god of the dead. So um, uh, this Akhir, um, uh, this Akhir uh, platform that it stood on, uh, it sort of hinted at his, uh, his um, belonging to tomorrow and yesterday at the same time going through uh, the netherworld. And uh, what's remarkable about this is this is the only remaining um, uh, image that we have of a bark in transit, except for one uh, sort of questionable thing. And there it is right along the procession route going through to the back here. And there it is, a uh, marvelous thing. And here you can see the, the brightness of uh, the, the color and uh, the uh, great care of the relief. It's, it's a beautiful scene. And there's the Akka platform. <coughs> but the rest of the thing is gone. Uh, the, the, the constant frustration you have working in this temple. Now, um, I'll go very quickly through a couple of other uh, chapels, just two here on, on the portico, and show you some other th uh, things. For instance, this uh, scene in uh, the uh, Chapel H, showing uh, this, uh, the, what is probably a statue of the king standing before an offering table while the god Thoth and Iumutef um, uh, the site of this menu. And behind him are the personifications of the Horus name. So this is the king has Horus being uh, renewed. <coughs> and uh, this is sort of a remarkable play on words uh, that uh, they, they um, do in these offering tables, 20 onions. And, O King Usamad, may accept the healthy teeth, had you, had you, white things of Horus, and provide them for yourself or equip your mouth. Over here, 
one pancreas, word spoken, O oh, King Uzaman, except the eye of Horus which you embrace. And uh, 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 so it goes. And so the king's Horus uh, uh, aspect is fulfilled and made a right again. And you have the same thing in uh, the temple of Seti, but here you can see huge temple. Also in another uh, temple, which has a lot of, in, in, the, in the, uh, the Hibis temple, a lot of the same uh, tables, uh, same, same phrases, and this whole, uh, uh, this whole prayer is associated with the opening of the mouth ceremony, which revives statues, makes them equivalent, uh, I mean, uh, effective to be able to hear, see the rituals taking, about, uh, taking place around them. And then on the focus part, the temple folk, uh, the, the, the cult focus part of the temple, uh, of this chapel, excuse me, you see the young Horus holding a bird, in fact it's the heat bird, the personification of the common people, and he has been revived here. And um, on the north wall, you see a further way in which the king has been being revived. He is uh, suckling the udder of the Hathor cow, and uh, here he is uh, in his full regalia. Notice that this is a this is an honest to God sledge. This this is not a fake. This is a probably a tremendously heavy statue and it's, um, it can only be moved on a sledge. Here's a scene like that in, the ha in uh, Del Bahri, showing the same uh, thing. The king has a child, the king completely renewed. On the, the west uh, wall of the cold focus of the adjoining chapel, you see the king being baptized. Baptized the water of life and dominion by Thoth and Horus. And uh, this uh, seems to have worked very well. So you see in the next scene, on the north wall, the king crowned with ram's horns. The ram's horns of the moon. He has now become subsumed into the god Amun. He's, a, he's an aspect of a moon. And uh, again, a statue that was so heavy that it could only be, it could only be uh, dragged about, not lifted up on a carrying pole. And so uh, that's just a little soupçon of what you have in an Egyptian <laughs> temple. Frustrating though it be, you can get these little elements. And um, uh, I don't want to go through all uh, 18, uh, 15 chapters. <laughs> yes, I'll stop there. And thank you. Sometimes uh, a bit of stone roof 
uh, over the, uh, the temples, on uh, the chapels, excuse me, on the, uh, the uh, west, northwest end of the temple, right? Well, they put uh, half of the temple is covered now with precast concrete, oh. which is sagging and uh, even it's really destroying the uh, limestone walls that's uh, supporting these uh, precast slabs. So there are now plans to replace them with a sandstone slabs, the original material that was uh, there, there before it was uh, came down. Yes, will they be pu publishing a revision to their book now that there's a palace? <laughs> <laughs> a revision to the book already? We've not, we've not even finished. <laughs> well, there, there will be some... Um, we'll address that in the third volume. <laughs> you know, I remember going to his home and seeing the book when it had just come out. I don't think I'm exaggerating. It's enormous. Filled with information. One last question? Yes, a hand. Was there that one poem, in other words, where women welcome us, well as men? Um, right? Use the mic. On, on the whole. Um, oh, use the mic. Well, Use the mic. On the whole, um, the, the priesthood was male. There are some special cults where uh, they were uh, uh, female uh, priests, female high priests. Um, but on the whole, this is a, this was a, a, a male occupation. It was usually literate as well. Um, however, in uh, the accessible parts of the temple during uh, um, festivals and during processions. Women were very much uh, sh shown inside of the temple. So uh, it, it's just that uh, just as many other religions, uh, the, today uh, the priesthood was basically a male occupation. Well, I want to thank our wonderful speakers and Ambassador Idris for addressing us. And I thank everyone for coming and enjoy the reception.